All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started. So again, welcome everybody to our first lecture of 2021. Um, tonight's lecture is Keepers of the Light, Women Lighthouse Keepers of the Hudson River. Uh, I've done this talk a couple of times, but I actually have some new information that we just discovered last year um, that I'm excited to share. It's not a ton of information as is often the case when you're doing historical research, um, but it should be pretty fun. So we're gonna give kind of an overview of the Hudson River Lighthouses and then dive right into uh, the different lighthouse keepers. All right, so here we go, if it lets me. All right, so I thought we would start with um, the third lighthouse district, which contains uh, all of the Hudson River as long as uh, you know Connecticut and Rhode Island and Long Island Sound. Um, so this is basically a 18, sorry, yeah, 19th century map um, of the third lighthouse district that has all of the Hudson River lighthouses at the time on it, uh, including a bunch north of Hudson Athens that are no longer there. So we're gonna be talking about some of those lights tonight. Um, this is kind of a timeline of our Hudson River lights. This is not all of the Hudson River lighthouses that were, um, but it gives you a little bit of a timeline. So we start with the opening of the Lake Champlain Canal. Stony Point is our first lighthouse in 1826. And then the most recent lighthouse is the third Rondat Lighthouse. You can see from on the, this list that there's multiple versions of different uh, structures in the same location. There's a bunch of reasons for that, which we'll talk about. Um, and then I thought I'd talk a little bit about the lighthouse keeper duties. Like what does a lighthouse keeper actually do? So their duties are to light and maintain the lantern, to wind the light turning mechanism, right? So before we have electricity um, and particularly before we have electric lights, uh, you know, it's a fixed lantern, a fixed light that you would have kind of a clockwork mechanism to wind up and that's what would turn, turn the light so that um, it flashed. Uh, in the event of fog, lighthouse keepers had to ring the fog bell or early on blow a fog horn. They had to keep excellent records of both the materials they used, of any incidents or accidents, things like that. And then whenever possible, they had to rescue any distressed persons on the water. Um, lighthouse keepers in the 19th and early 20th century were kind of like first responders in many instances. Um, on the Hudson River in a lot of places because the Coast Guard was not really as big at that point um, or as focused on search and rescue as it is today. So lighthouse keepers were kind of like the first line of defense for that sort of thing. So here's just some images of the type of work that would be done. So this is a woman cleaning the Fresnel lens for an electric lighthouse. This is not from um, the Hudson Valley. It's very hard to find interior photos of lighthouses in the Hudson Valley. Um, this is a man in California cleaning the exterior of the uh, tower housing of the light. Basically, all of the glass had to be kept extraordinarily clean and free of soot to make sure that the light was as clear and bright as possible at all times. Um, this is a man who is refilling the uh, oil reservoir in this uh, oil, oil fueled light. And you can see it's a huge light that he's inside the Fresnel lens actually. So this is from a coastal, a huge coastal lighthouse. And then this one actually is from West Point. So this is the keeper winding the mechanism at the West Point lighthouse from around 1900. And then this is an example of the type of fog bell that would be uh, rung manually, not necessarily rung by the clapper as we think of now, but it was kind of like on a rocker that would ring the bell. Um, and sound it so that the boats traveling through the fog could kind of keep an ear out uh, for where they were and use that sounding to make sure that they knew where they were on the river. All right, so the really big thing in lighthouse history in the Hudson River is the opening of the Erie Canal in 1825. Um, we had steamboats on the Hudson River since 1807 with Robert Fulton um, in the early I think it's the early 1820s, the Fulton Livingston monopoly on steamboats is broken. And then with the opening of the canals in 1823 with Lake Champlain, the Erie in 1825 and the d &H in 1828, all of a sudden you have a ton of steamboats on the river. 
Uh, this being an example of some of the steamboats. This is from the big opening of the Erie Canal in New York City. Um, and so that increased traffic meant that there were more vessels traveling at night. And so there was more of a need for lighthouses than there was before. A lot of sloops and schooner transport, they would just anchor at night and only travel during the day. Um, our women lighthouse keepers, our very first one on this list is a brand new one that we didn't really know about um, prior to this summer. She is a lighthouse keeper for a very short period of time at Stony Point. Um, then we have Christina Whitbeck at Stuyvesant, Dorcas Schoonmaker at Saugerties, and Whitbeck at Stuyvesant. That's Christina's daughter. Catherine Murdoch at Rondout, Nancy Rose at Stony Point, Joanna Lawton at Skodak Channel Light, Eliza Smith at the in Baltimore Stake Light, Kate Crowley and her sister Ellen um, unofficially at Saugerties and Melinda Rose, who's Nancy Rose's daughter at Stony Point. So these were all official lighthouse keepers, right? They were all um, on the government payroll officially. There are a couple of other women that we're gonna be talking about tonight who were unofficially <laughs> lighthouse keepers um, and who were really involved in um, preserving some of the Hudson River lighthouses. So they're not officially lighthouse keepers, but I consider them lighthouse keepers. What is going All right, on? so we'll start with Stony Point. And I'm just gonna remind everybody if you're not muted to please keep yourself muted so we don't have any background noise. So Stony Point was first installed in 1826. It is actually the oldest of the Hudson River lighthouses and the first. Um, it's also the oldest one still around today, which is kind of cool that we still have it. Um, Sarah Parkinson, our first Stony Point female lighthouse keeper, um, she, her husband, Robert Parkinson, was one of the first keepers at Stony Point. Uh, he died in 1834. Um, and so she was officially keeper from July to December, really only six months. Uh, and she was replaced by a male keeper, Leonard K. Baker, and Sarah and her four ch five children were forced to move out of the lighthouse, um, which was a bit of a hardship for them. So this was not uncommon, but it became less common um, as the century wore on. I think uh, the U.S. Lighthouse Service in particular became more, after the Civil War, became a little more um, uh, sympathetic to widowed women and their children and making sure that they had um, a livelihood. And also, I think in part because a lot of the lighthouse keeper duties are kind of traditionally feminine duties, right? It's a lot of cleaning, <laughs> basically, um, and keeping records and, and maintenance that's not particularly heavy, except for carrying oil up those flights of stairs to refill, refill the lanterns. Um, so she's the first and one of the shortest official lighthouse keepers. This is a later image of Stony Point. Stony Point is just a very small two-story stone tower. Um, and there was a separate keeper's residence, which is pictured here. This, this photo is from around 1900. So Stony Point had three female lighthouse keepers, which is a little unusual. So the second set were the Roses. So Alexander Rose was keeper um, from 1853 to 1857. He actually died, uh, we think, carrying timber for construction of a new bell tower for the fog bell. Um, and the, they think he ruptured a blood vessel and then that's what killed him. So Nancy Rose took over um, as lighthouse keeper. She was assisted uh, when he got older by one of their sons, um, but she was the primary lighthouse keeper on the payroll. She was a uh, keeper until 1904. And then her daughter, Melinda, took over. Melinda was 53 at the time. Um, and she, after one year, she said, you know what, it's, it's only $500 a year. That's not really enough to live on. Um, so she voluntarily left the lighthouse in 1905. Nancy Rose was fairly beloved um, by the locals. There is an instance in 1901 where the steamer Poughkeepsie uh, runs up on the rocks near Stony Point in the fog. And it's not super clear what happened. Um, the captain says that he couldn't hear the fog bell, but also like second guessed himself and turned 
too early. Um, other people on shore swear they heard the fog bell. Um, a newspaper record at the time said that the people from the wreck like went up the hill and knocked on the on the lighthouse keeper's door and like woke up Nancy Rose. So it's not clear if she was actually awake and ringing the fog bell at that time. Um, but a lot of the locals, you know, vociferously defended her. Um, in 1903, she retired um, at age 79 and was awarded a service medal from the Scenic and Historic Society. And then in 1904, um, Melinda took over. And that is coincidentally the same year that Nancy dies. So she did not have much of a retirement. All right, our next lighthouse that we're gonna be talking about is the Stuyvesant Lighthouse. Um, Stuyvesant Lighthouse is not around anymore. This is actually the second incarnation, the um, 1860s version of the Stuyvesant Lighthouse. This photo was taken around 1900. Um, and another early family who cared for the lighthouse was were the Whitbecks. Um, so the Stuyvesant Lighthouse was built in 1829. Volkert Whitbeck was the first lighthouse keeper from 1830, we think to 1841. We're not sure. I haven't been able to find any, any death records for him. But the stone, the original stone lighthouse is actually destroyed in 1832 by an ice dam. And I have a story I'm going to read you about that because it's very affecting. Um, after Volkert died, Christina, his wife Christina, took over as lighthouse keeper, and then their daughter Anne took over as lighthouse keeper. So again, it's like a three, you know, three different family members keeping the same light. And I'm going to read to you um, a letter that someone wrote to um there's actually it became a very famous incident there were a couple of different letters written about this incident to different journals um the one i'm going to read from me to you i found in the american railroad journal it was published in march of 1832 um and i've seen this same letter crop up in a couple of different newspapers so i think it kind of got passed around so i'm going to take a sip of water <laughs> and read it to you it says a melancholy occurrence. On Tuesday last, about 12 o'clock, the ice in the Hudson River at Stuyvesant Landing began to give way. The river had at that time risen to an unusual height, the water being 12 feet above the low water mark, covering the docks to a depth of four feet and making an entr entrance into most of the storehouses on the wharves. These buildings were uninjured. The ice continued to move for about two hours and apparently in one solid mass, several miles in extent. During this interval, a most distressing scene was witnessed at the upper lighthouse, the Stuyvesant Lighthouse, situated a mile and a half above the landing. This was a stone building 20 feet by 34 and two stories high, so basically the same as the Stony Point Lighthouse, um, with a mole surrounding it four feet in height. The water had risen to the top of the mole before the ice began to move, which rendered the situation of the inmates of the lighthouse, not prisoners, just the people who live there. <laughs> Truly alarming. Soon the immense field of ice above was seen to swing from its moorings and coming down with irresistible force struck the lighthouse, which in a moment was made a heap of ruins. The following letter contains a very moving account of that incident. So this is the letter to the Kinderhook Sentinel, the editor of the Kinderhook Sentinel. And it says, sir, I am about to record one of the most afflicting and singular providences I have ever witnessed. The Hudson River had been rising for more than 24 hours when the ice began to give way. It was thought that the lighthouse, standing about a mile above the landing, was in danger of being injured by the large bodies of ice which were floating down the river. About 12 o'clock today, two gentlemen with great difficulty made the lighthouse in a small boat, as it was now standing in and entirely surrounded by water. They advised Mr. Whitbeck, the occupant of the house, to leave it altogether with his family immediately. They accordingly made preparations to do so by removing their furniture to the upper story and making a comfortable disposition of their cows and other stock. When nearly ready to leave their threatened home, suddenly and with terrible violence, the ice came rushing upon the house. They were startled by one awful and tremendous and terrible or and tremendous crash and in less than a minute, the whole two-story stone edifice was a mingled heap of ruins. The family, consisting of 10 persons, with the exception of one, were in the building when it fell. Four of them disappeared and were either buried beneath the ruins or swept off by the impetuous flood. 
Two daughters of Mr. Whitbeck, one aged 15 and the other 13, and two of his grandsons, one 14 and the other two, were the victims of this dire catastrophe. By timely assistance afforded by the two gentlemen alluded to, who were nearer in a boat, six out of 10 were saved. The survivors were badly bruised and on reaching the so shore, so chilled and exhausted that they were unable to walk. They were taken to a house nearby and made as comfortable as circumstances would admit. I am informed that it is not expected Mrs. Whitbeck will recover. She does. And that the recovery of the other members of the family is considered very doubtful. I have seen and conversed with Mr. Whitbeck this evening. He was as comfortable as I expected to find him, but he was a man of sorrows and afflicted with grief. My heart moved within me when I saw the man and heard him speak. His eyes were suffused with tears when he spoke of the calamity which had bereft him of his dear children. The sympathies of all the bystanders were so excited in his that they wept, but I could endure it no longer when he raised his streaming eyes towards heaven and cried in the agony of his heart and of his soul, oh my children, my children, where are they? The family is now left in a destitute condition to share the lot of the suffering and the poor. Yours, John Allen. Well, John Allen, John Allen knows how to tell a story, doesn't he? So this is a real true story that actually happened. Um, the Kinderhook, sorry, the Stuyvesant Lighthouse was destroyed by an ice dam in 1832. The family was left destitute. They had nothing. Their house was destroyed. They didn't have um, any means of taking care of themselves. They didn't have a job, right? No lighthouse. You can't be a lighthouse keeper. But the people of Kinderhook um, and Stuyvesant Landing actually petitioned the president, who in 1832 was Martin Van Buren, who is from where? Kinderhook. Um, they petitioned him to keep Volker Whitbeck on as lighthouse keeper until a new lighthouse could be built. So he actually retained his salary, even though he didn't have a job until the new lighthouse was completed in 1835. So he was on the payroll for several years um, before the new house lighthouse was completed. And then of course, Christina took over as keeper and then Anne after her. Um, I did find this one reference. So this is an interesting thing. It's just like when you're a historian, you like to have corroborating evidence um, because this reference says that Anne Whitbeck is the lighthouse keeper at Stuyvesant on the Hudson River, some 20 miles below Albany. She was appointed to that position by the president in the year 1832. No, false. Volker Whitbeck was still, <laughs> still lighthouse keeper then. Um, and then she said, it says her husband was the keeper of the lighthouse previous to that time. No, Anne is the daughter. Um, yeah, Mr. Whitbeck was not killed. Anyway, I just find it interesting that they got her. It's supposed to be Christina Whitbeck, but Volkert was not killed. And because Christina doesn't become the lighthouse keeper until 1841. So presumably Volkert continues on as lighthouse keeper until then. Anyway, just a fun little reference. All right, now we're moving on down the river to the Rondout Lighthouse, our local lighthouse in Kingston. Um, the first Rondout Lighthouse was built in 1837. This is a drawing from a Hudson River panorama of 1845, I believe. It's available on archive.org if anybody wants to go look it up. Um, and you'll see a lot of these, this style of lighthouse is pictured. Um, and for a long time, this is the only image we had of this lighthouse until we found um, this beautiful Jervis McEntee painting, which is privately held. And if you look closely, oh, look, <laughs> there's the Rondout Lighthouse at the entrance of Rondout Creek, which looks quite different than it does today. So that's the original lighthouse. Um, and there, there were a number of male keepers until 1856. George Murdoch becomes keeper in that original 1830s lighthouse. Um, he actually drowns after just a year. Uh, and his wife, Catherine, who had two children already and was pregnant with a third um, when they moved in, had basically, she had a brand new baby. Um, she petitions the government to allow her to become lighthouse keeper, which she does. And she is the longest serving woman lighthouse keeper on the Hudson River in the second longest serving keeper period. Um, she served for 50 years from 1857 until 1907 when she retired. She was assisted by that baby who was born in the lighthouse, James, um, he became assistant keeper in 1880 because of the installation of uh, the breakwater jetty at the mouth of Rondout Creek, um, because there had to be, there were three red stake lights that had to be maintained 
uh, on that uh, jetty. And then he became Rhonda Lighthouse Keeper when she retired in 1907 until 1923. So the three family members actually served in all three different lighthouses because there were three different lighthouses. Um, Catherine was a local girl. She's officially appointed head keeper in July. Um, her husband actually dies in, in May, so she has a couple of months as unofficial keeper there until she's officially appointed. And this is the house that she spends the most time in. So the original 1830s house was replaced um, by this stone one that if you have seen the Saugerties Lighthouse or if you saw the Cyberstone Lighthouse, they look a lot alike, right? They're all built from the same plans in the late 1860s. Um, so Catherine Murdoch spent the most time in this lighthouse. Uh, if you've been out of the mouth of Rondout Creek by boat, um, you have seen the round stone foundation, which is still there. You can see it very nicely in this picture. Um, and so there's this interesting little story about being in this lighthouse before the dikes were built, right? So now there's breakwater jetties out in the middle of the of the river that are kind of protecting this lighthouse and the new lighthouse, but those were not installed until the 1870s, late 1870s. So she tells the story and it says, one morning before the dikes were built, Mrs. Murdoch sat in her little room sewing. Suddenly her ears were greeted with a crash of glass. She turned around and saw a schooner's boom had entered the window and stuck halfway across the room. The schooner had been crowded into the lighthouse by a tow. So this lighthouse is located on the south side of the mouth of Rondout Creek. And so what happened is a tugboat with a long string of barges was trying to come into the creek, right? Make a turn, a left-hand turn into the creek and a schooner under sail was trying to make a left-hand turn at the same time. And the tugboat turned tightly enough that the schooner could not avoid the lighthouse and crashed into it. So this is a map of those uh, dikes that were put in, you can see the yellow dot kind of in the center there is the 1867 lighthouse. Um, and then each dike has some dates on it. There was that first little one in 1877. Um, and then the last one on the north side of the river, the branch dike was completed in 1879. And you can also see there's three pale red dots that say light on them. So those were James Murdoch's responsibility when he became assistant keeper in 1880 and then Catherine Murdoch kept the light itself. Um, this change to the map of the Rondo Creek, however, basically rendered that old um, stone lighthouse fairly obsolete. And there was a petition to produce a new lighthouse, um, which they did right where that uh, red dot is on the point of the North Jetty. That's today's lighthouse, which James Murdoch was the first keeper of. All right, I'm gonna read you another interesting newspaper article <laughs> because it has a great quote in it and it's another flood right now a lot of our tributaries of the Hudson River are dammed mostly hydroelectric dams um, so we don't get this kind of flooding as much anymore and also we don't have because of climate change we don't have fast um, melts uh, at different times of the year with lots of snowpack so that's what causes a lot of these floods but so I'm going to read this one about the flood of uh, December of 1878. So it says, but the worst time that Mrs. Murdoch thinks she ever experienced was on the night of December 19th, 1878, at which time the big flood in the Rondout Creek in the Hudson River occurred. At about 10 o'clock on that night, the waters began to arise to an alarming degree and surge and boil around the lighthouse. On the previous afternoon, a friend of Mrs. Murdoch's who had a foreboding of danger visited the lighthouse and urged her to go ashore, telling her that the lighthouse would surely be swept away and she and her children would be drowned. She replied, this is Mur Mrs. Catherine Murdoch talking, I will never desert my post of duty. I am a woman I know, but if the lighthouse goes down tonight, I go with it. The lighthouse remains today upon the same sound foundation as it did that night. At 12 o'clock, Mrs. Murdoch ascended the tower and looked out. She could not see anything. It was pitch dark but the sound of the rushing waters told her plainly that the flood, instead of decreasing, was increasing. At about three o'clock, the guard lock at Eddyville gave way. That's on the canal. The water swept everything before it. Boats were torn loose from their moorings and caught up by the raging flood. In one instance, a barn containing a horse and a number of chickens was swept from its foundations. 
It glided along with the swift current, keeping in the middle of the stream until it reached the dike opposite the lighthouse where it struck. When daylight appeared, Mrs. Murdoch was amazed to see a horse standing on the dike, trembling with fright, while all around the animals surged a mighty vortex of muddy waters. Most of the barn, which had gone to pieces, lay piled in a heap on the site of the old lighthouse. So that's the 1830s lighthouse. This explained the loud crash of timber she had heard and what at first she thought was the lighthouse falling apart. The flats were strewn with the wrecks of schooners, sloops, and barges. One schooner rested on top of the dike. Before any attempt could be made to rescue the horse on the dike, the animal plunged into the water and swam to Port Ewan, a distance of over a mile, none the worse for its thrilling adventure. So that is a newspaper article about the flood of December of 1878. And I just love that quote. I have seen that quote in another newspaper article. It's not quite identical, um, but the line, if the lighthouse goes down tonight, I go with it, definitely shows up in more than one instance. So I love that quote, right? All righty. So like I said, in 1880, James is appointed assistant keeper. Um, at some point, Catherine remarries. She marries uh, Jeremiah Perkins and has another son. Um, he actually dies in the 1870s or 1880s. Um, and then she retires in 1907. And just a couple of years later, she dies at the age of 81. So this is her uh, little obituary. Um, and I believe she is interred at the Port Ewan Cemetery. So if anybody wants to go and visit her, they can. And this is the new Rondout Light, you can see, was built on the North Dyke there in 1915. And that is the first one that uh, James Murdoch and his wife, Emma, uh, end up in. They are the first keepers of this new light, which is still our Rondout Lighthouse today. So uh, now I want to talk about some unofficial women associated with the lighthouse. So Robert Howard was the last civilian keeper of the Rondout Lighthouse from 1838 to 1845. Um, he and his wife, Matilda, moved there in 1838 with their daughters, Lila and Esther. And this is a picture of them. Lila is the older girl on the left. Esther is the young one on the right. Um, and we have a ton of really awesome family pictures of them. But Esther has given her remembrances to the the museum of growing up in the lighthouse, um, including a story about uh, the picture on the right. You can see uh, Robert Howard is standing with the two girls on the ice in the flats behind the lighthouse. Um, and that is how Esther and Lila got to school in the wintertime when the flats froze over, they would walk across the ice to go to school in Pukaki. Uh, and she talks about one time um, the ice broke and she fell through the ice and thankfully her sister Lila there was, was there to um, haul her out and they went back into the house to get dried off and warmed up. And then their mother sent them back out to go to school. <laughs> they, were, they were not staying in that lighthouse during the day, I guess, in the winter time. Um, so yeah, unofficial, but, but another great story of ladies and lighthouses. All right, now we're gonna go to Saugerties. Uh, the original Saugerties Lighthouse was built in 1835. This is an image, again, from that 1840s Hudson River panorama. Um, and they had another very early lighthouse keeper. So Abraham Schoonmaker um, became lighthouse keeper in 1845. And there's a little bit of an interesting story with that um, that I want to talk about. So let me pull up my notes here. So until after the Civil War, all lighthouse keepers in the whole country were appoint were direct appointed, uh, direct political appointees by the president, right? This was not an elected position. It was not, you know, like a civil service position. It was a political appointment. And so the Saugerties Lighthouse um, in 1842, under President Tyler's administration, Joseph H. Burhans was appointed keeper. Um, but then when Tyler lost, um, the Democrat James Polk became president and he appointed Abraham Schoonmaker in 1845. So Abraham got very ill um, and died after only a year as lighthouse keeper. So his wife Dorcas Schoonmaker became lighthouse keeper. Um, but in 1849, the Whig party regained the presidency and basically they kicked Dorcas out and made Joseph Burhans the lighthouse keeper again. So there's kind of this, you know, jostling of political appointments depending on which political party is in power. 
Um, so she did not have a particularly lengthy um, tenure as White House Keeper. There was a pretty t- terrible fire um, in 1849, right at the end of her tenure, which may have had something to do with, with her being removed. Um, but a lantern exploded uh, and the lighthouse caught fire. So it was repaired. It did not burn down. The fire was repaired. Um, and then a new lighthouse was built in the 1870s, sorry, the 1860s, 1869, this new lighthouse, which again, looks very much like the second Rondo lighthouse and the, Sti- the second Stuyvesant lighthouse, right? It's a whole generation of those original 1830s lighthouses were replaced in the 1860s. Um, and they had another female keeper, actually set of female keepers. So the Crowley family moved in 1865, um, right before the new lighthouse was built. And Dennis Crowley um, apparently went blind, like he had cataracts or something. Um, So he went blind very early on. His son, Daniel, took over as lighthouse keeper for a while, but then he left for a more lucrative job in 1873. And their daughter, Kate Crowley, um, became lighthouse keeper officially in 1873. And she was assisted by her sister, Ellen, who is actually the older daughter, but Kate was apparently the more able and athletic. Kate had grown up um, in the lighthouse and like followed her dad and her brother around and learned everything there was to know about lighthouse keeping. So she was the official keeper until 1885. Not clear why she left, um, but then her nephew, James Crowley became keeper from 1885 to 1895. So again, kind of a family dynasty um, at the Saugerties Lighthouse. And There is another really interesting newspaper article that I'm just going to read you a portion of because it's quite long, although I think we did um, publish it on our, whoops, sorry, I'm going to, I didn't have it open. I apologize. Um, We did publish it on our history blog. So if anybody wants to check out the full version on the Hudson River Maritime Museum history blog, you can. So sorry, I thought I had this open. Let me get it open quick. because it is a great article. (laughs) Okay, here we go. And it kind of went viral a little bit, like the version I have um, was published in the New York Sun, um, but it also showed up in the New York Times and like it showed up in Carlinville, Illinois and all kinds of interesting things. So a lot of other newspapers around the country picked it up. So this is from November 25th, 1878. Um, The title is called Kate and Ellen Crowley, the maidens who take care of the Saugerties light and modestly say that they are merely supporting their aged parents, but who are heroines as noble as any in the world, right, is how the original title goes. Um, Okay, it's kind of long, so I'm not probably going to read the whole thing, but it says, they live in a lighthouse not over 120 miles from New York on the Hudson River, keep it themselves and their lamp is always trimmed and burning. And on a foggy night when the light is not visible, you can hear one of them a mile off blowing a foghorn herself where the government has been too mercenary to give them one of the automatic kind. Moreover, they have saved many lives. Miss Kate C. Crowley is the mistress and keeper of Sari's lighthouse. She is capable of any daring need involving danger or self-sacrifice. And as to the manner in which the lighthouse is kept, it is unexcelled. Accounts are always kept right. The light is always burning. And Miss Crowley is the very best kind of keeper. So the conceit of this article is that the writer is in the pilot house of um, a steamboat talking to the steersman, right? The pilot who has kind of like a folksy way of talking. So um, they're talking about what's that light that they can see in the distance. And it goes, that's 15 miles away, said the man at the wheel. That's Sardi's light. We'll lose it again a dozen times in the turns of the river. Do I know the girls? Well, no, not to speak to them, but I've seen them on the river many a time by daylight, pulling away on a great heavy rowboat that no two rivermen would care to handle in one of them gales that sweep down through the mountains. It ain't like a tumultuous sea, hey? Well, that just shows you how little you know about these North River storms. Why, when we get some of these hurricane blasts, they sweep down through these gaps from the north and another current comes up from the south and God help any vessel that gets caught in the maelstrom when they meet. 
Well, it was on one of those occasions that I was coming up the river in the old Columbus after she would got out of carrying passengers and took to the towing business. We got a little north of Rondout and I was all alone at the wheel. I heard a rumbling behind me and I looked around and when I saw a great big cloud with thunderheads rushing up from the south, I knew we were going to catch a ripper. This was nothing, however, to the heavy clouds that came sweeping down from the north in an opposite direction. And then I saw that the two storms would meet. I hollered down the trumpet to the engineer to slower the engine and made up my mind to keep headway and stay in the river as it would be unsafe to try and make a landing. In a few minutes, the two storms struck us. The boat, co boat cavorted like a frisky horse and the foaming water plunged and reared and shook every timber. We were then pretty near abreast of Tivoli and Sorry's lighthouse is only about two miles ahead. A sloop loaded with bluestone, which had just pulled out from the mouth of the Estopus Creek, was standing down the river and went over when the squall struck her, and I soon saw two men struggling in the water. Hardly a minute elapsed before two female forms were flooding ar fluttering around the small boat by the lighthouse. In another minute it was launched and it bobbed up and down in the seething, foaming waters. The two girls, bareheaded with a pair of oars apiece, began pulling toward the men in the water. The, the waves ran so high, the gale blew so madly, the thunder roared so incessantly, and the lightning flashed in such blinding sheets that it seemed impossible for the women ever to reach the men, to keep headway or to keep from being swamped. But they never missed the opportunity of a rising billow to give them leverage, and they managed by steady pulling to get ahead until they reached the men in the water. The great danger was that the tossing boat would strike the sailors and end their career. But one of the gals leaned forward over the bow of the boat, braced her feet beneath the seat on which she had been sitting, stiffened herself out for a great effort, and as her sister kept the bow of the craft crosswise to the wave, caught one of the men beneath the arms as he struck out on top of a billow, lifted and threw him by main force into the middle of the boat, and then prepared for the other man. He had got hold of the sloop's rudder, which had got unshipped and was floating in the water. He let go and swam toward the rowboat and was hauled in also by the woman and his half-drowned comrade. You couldn't have got any river boatmen to do what those girls did. So that's just one of the stories in this fairly lengthy article um, about Kate and Ellen Crowley. Um, as I said, if you want to read the whole thing, it's on our blog. It's pretty awesome. Um, there's another story about rescuing people who had fallen through the ice. Um, there's another story about how they grew up on skiffs in uh, Sopus Creek. Um, it's just a really interesting story and an interesting pair of girls. So moving on, I do want to talk about an unofficial keeper, uh, Ruth Reynolds Glunt. She was not officially keeper of the Sardis Lighthouse. Um, her husband, Chester Glunt, was, um, did work at Turkey Point, uh, which is a Coast Guard station. Uh, so, and that's just south of Saugerties. So I think they probably got to see the lighthouse a lot. She wrote a book in 1975 called Lighthouses and Legends of the Hudson about her experiences um, and some of the stories that came out of the Saugerties Lighthouse. She got the Saugerties Lighthouse in the National Register in 1978 uh, and then helped found the Saugerties Lighthouse Conservancy in 1985. So that lighthouse was in pretty rough shape when the Conservancy took over. Uh, so she was instrumental in saving that structure from demolition. All right, now a couple of lighthouses that aren't really lighthouses and that we don't actually know that much about. So Skodak Channel Light um, was basically a small signal light at the south side of an island at the mouth of Skodak Channel, uh, which is up north uh, toward Albany. And there is on the official Coast Guard record, a woman named Joanna Lawton is listed as keeper from 1860 to 1873. We think this was probably more like a stake light, um, not a lighthouse, so it didn't require as much maintenance um, as a lighthouse and she did not live on site. There's no structure on site to live there. Um, and she's listed as Mrs. Joanna Lawton. So presumably um, she was a widow and maybe that's how she got that job, but we don't know anything else about her. Haven't been able to find anything yet. The other one is the New Baltimore Steak Light, um, which is on the east side of the river on an island just off of New Baltimore. And again, we don't know um, 
that much about either the light or Eliza Smith, who is listed in the Coast Guard record as an official keeper from 1864 to 1870. All right, and our last one, Esopus Meadows. Um, the Esopus Meadows Lighthouse, this lighthouse was built in 1871, replacing an earlier 1839 lighthouse. And you can see the islands um, behind it. That's the original foundation of the 1839 lighthouse. Um, again, they didn't, they had like an unofficial lighthouse keeper. Um, Ellie and Manny Resendez uh, were keepers, I believe, after the McClintocks. Um, but Andrew McClintock was keeper there from 18, sorry, 1926 to 1932. And his daughter Doris or Dory McClintock, that's a picture of her there. She's so adorable. She grew up in the Esopus Meadows Lighthouse. Um, and when the State of Esopus Lighthouse Commission started restoration work on the lighthouse, uh, she was instrumental in helping them uh, know which rooms were had what purpose. And she helped them uh, decide, you know, like what paint colors and furnishings and things to put in there. Um, so she was pretty instrumental in the restoration of that lighthouse. Um, and even though she wasn't an official keeper, she grew up there. All right, and then, like I said, I need to add a slide about the Resendez. So um, Manny and Ellie Resendez were lighthouse keepers um, of Esopus Meadows after the McClintocks. Um, and Ellie, I think, ended up getting left alone a lot at the lighthouse and being kind of unofficial lighthouse keeper. So. She's another one of those unofficial ones, right? I think basically any woman who lives in a lighthouse was kind of an unofficial <laughs> lighthouse keeper, right? It's not, not an easy job for one person to do by themselves. 